you guys got some stuff. Blakers, you're ready? I, oh, of course I'm ready. Do you mind doing number 70 for 3.4? 3.4 number 70? Please. Sure. So it says, let g of x equal e to the cx plus f of x, and h of x equal e to the kx f of x, where our f of 0 is 3, f prime of 0 is 5, and f double prime of 0 is negative 2. Find g prime of 0 and g double prime of 0 in terms of c. OK. So g prime of x is going to be e to the cx times c plus f prime of x. OK. Well. I know that then g prime of 0 is going to equal e to the c times 0 times c plus f prime of 0. So c times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, 1 times c is c and f prime of 0 is 5. So there's my g prime of 0. Does that feel OK? Um, can you just explain? So OK, yep, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to do g double prime of x, then it's going to be c times the derivative of e to the cx. Well, the derivative of e to the cx is e to the cx times c. And then it'll be plus the derivative of f, which will be f double prime of x. Oh, okay. So g double prime of 0, c times e to the c times 0 times c plus f double prime of 0. Again, c times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1. So I'm going to have c squared. And then f double prime of 0 is negative 2. So just one more time, so you get two C's, or so you, like you, it's. So here is just that, and then you take out another. So when I do the chain rule, when I do the derivative of the inside, the Cx, that's where the extra C is coming at the end. Okay. Right? Yeah, no, I get, I get what okay. you're saying, yeah. Okay. So that's part A. Part B says, in terms of k, find the equation for the tangent line to the graph of h at the point where x is equal to 0. OK, so for the tangent line, I'm going to need two things. I'm going to need the point. So I'm going to start with h of 0. So e to the k times 0 times f of 0. So that's going to be 1 times 3. So the point that I have is the point 0, 3. Everybody's OK with that? So my slope then is going to be h prime of 0. Actually, let's just write as h prime of x first, and then we'll plug the 0 in. So that's going to be a product rule. So I'm going to have the first 
function times the derivative of the second function plus the second function times the derivative of the first function and to take the derivative of e k to the x or I'm sorry e to the kx that's going to be e to the kx times the derivative of the inside which is just k times 1 So if I want the slope at x equals 0, that's going to be the same as h prime of 0. And then f prime of 0 was 5. And f of 0 was 3. And e to the k times 0 times k. So this turns into then 5 plus 3k. So my slope then will be y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 or y equals 5 plus 3kx plus 3. That ought to do it. Does that feel okay? Just some stinky algebra, right? Luke? Um, do you mind cranking out how to Same section, 3, oh, yeah, 4? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. 35, you said? 35, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is just a nasty boy, is all this is. Um, so... I like kind of like separated them to like FX, UX, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so my FX, which is going to be the cosine of 1 minus that, and then G of X, I had that inside, and then I separated the inside into the derivatives of 1 minus E to X. Does that sound right? Or is that like. So you're basically doing that, right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I love it. So y prime then is going to be f prime of g of x times g prime of x. And g prime of x is going to be uh, k of x times h prime of x minus h prime of x times k of x. Oops prime over k of x squared. That looks good. Let's start filling these in. So derivative of, co or of cosine is negative sine, negative sine. Uh, the derivative of h of x is just going to be negative e to the 2x times 2. And the derivative for k of x is just going to be positive e to the 2x times 2. Is that okay? And yeah, those are chain rules, but it just feels like at that point I shouldn't do that chain rule in the head. It just gets more confusing to keep writing as like compositions inside a composition inside a composition. Just like, ugh, I can do that. Okay. Uh, so plug it in time. So I'm going to have negative sine of 1 minus e to the 2x over 1 plus e to the 2x times the quantity uh, 1 plus e to the 2x times negative 2 e to the 2x over um, Let's see, where do I have h of x? Uh, 1 minus e to the 2x times positive 2 e to the 2x. Oops, 
x. So that parts can just reduce. And I can just take this stray negative sign here and cancel it with that one. So I would just write this as sine 1 minus e to the 2x over 1 plus e to the 2x times 1 plus e to the 2x over 1 minus e to the 2x and call her good. So Oh, what did I do here? I did not put these in the right place. I'm my massive apologies here, people. Mr. Kulik just had like a minor brain hemorrhage. So this thing is supposed to be subtracted from that stuff. There we go. I looked at that and I'm like, that can't possibly over that. There we go. That seems more likely. Yeah, yeah. It's like you sh everyone should have been like, uh, what? So probably some like terms I can combine here. So I'll, let's go ahead and distribute some stuff through. Um, would it be okay just to leave it like that as a final answer? Um, depending on the instructions, probably. But like those cancel out, and then these guys are like terms. So I can make that quite a bit nicer. And that's probably what the back of the book answer looks like, if I were to take a guess. I try to always assign you guys the odds, by far and away, the majority, because I want you to check things, right? Like, Well, I, what I've been doing is pretty much leaving them quite, quite I'm not simplifying them. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it, here, here's, essentially, my plan would be, on a chapter like this, if I want a simplified to a specific form, the question will be phrased, show that derivative whatever equals this. And I'll tell you what I need you to make it, turn it into. Your job would be to like do the algebra to get it to look like what I'm asking for. If I wanted something fully simplified. If not, I would say that you're done when the calculus is done. Okay? Does that feel like a fair way of kind of how much do I simplify? The answer would be like, to here, unless I, you know, if I'm telling you to here, otherwise, don't. Just stop when the derivative is done. Just be finished with it. Or the calculus part is done, I should say. Does that sound okay? Which again, like, if you're checking your answers in the back of the book, like occasionally, yes, it's nice to kind of grind through the algebra, but you don't have to do that every single time. Blake? Same section? Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> well, that is so little. Ah, but I can't read that very well at all. I'm assuming that's a 3 ln What is the, what? You just zoom in on this real quick on the PDF. I should really see that a little bit better. 41? Oh, I see. Yeah, let's try screen clipping that again. There we go. That's much better. What is this thing doing? Go away. Nobody wants your. Nobody wants your help. Okay. 
So, oh boy, easy. All right. So, remember, this piece is the piece that's going to get you. Remember, the way you want to think about this is is that way. So my outer function is x squared. The next innermost function is sine of x. And then inside of that function is e to the x. Inside of that function is another x squared. And then inside of that is sine x. <coughs> and I'm just going to pretend this is a y here because I don't want, I already used f, and I just don't want to go back and change all my letters <laughs> now, so I'm just going to pretend that's different. The nice thing, though, is that this that y is just f of g of h of i of j of x. Which is nice for me because to do the derivative just means I'm going to have f prime of g of h of i of j times g prime of h of i of j of k. Oh, oh sorry. So no. like that, like the, there was like that formula mm -hmm. that gave us where it just like it decreased. Yeah, so h yeah. of j of x, and then i prime of j of x, and then j prime of x. Which is nice because that was pretty easy to write out because it's just like, Chain, 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 chain. Um, so all I need here is the derivatives, and I should be good. So it's going to be 2x. That'll be cosine. That's easy. That one's just e to the x. Here's another 2x. And here is a, another cosine. So what do we have here? We have two times cosine of e to the two cosine x. Ah, boogers, I looked at the wrong things. Sine of e to the sine, I think this is supposed to be a t in here, or sine squared t. Let's do that, it's less parentheses. Okay, and then we have cosine of e to the sine squared t. And then we have e to the sine squared t. And then we have um, 2 sine uh, t. And then we have cosine t. I think that I think that does it. So it's just that um it's just you can you can apply that formula for as many um shapes as yeah, you can just keep chaining and chaining and chaining and chaining and chaining and chaining. And just like you lose one out of the composition each time. Until you get, until you get down. To yeah, the yeah. It's just like a what is that? That's five chain rules or something that are linked all together. There's probably a sneakier way of doing this since it's like that sine to the t is in there, kind of sine squared t is in there twice. Yeah. There's probably a sneaky way of like, oh, if I think about this, do the derivative of this, and then I can just apply it inside of the other one or something. But this seemed obvious and wasn't too time consuming so I just went bulldoze straight ahead as it like a bunch of chains all together as it seemed like that would be the what you would want to do rather than some sneaky shortcut yeah 
and this wasn't gonna I could see this wasn't gonna be too too bad um, once you had it written out like the, the toughest part was probably seeing this and getting every yeah. getting like the composition correct huh. but if you got that far you should have been yeah I was just playing with this one. yeah it should have been okay because um, the chain rule is actually an easy derivative rule to use it's just getting at everything in the right places. Paul? I was just gonna ask if we were ever gonna learn something that would like make this seem any kind of complicated chain rules because it's kind of like the simple solve the world response. Um there is some stuff that we'll look at in 3.6 that can make some problems that are really complicated much less complicated. So there's there's another like kind of shortish cut coming. Um, but it doesn't always, for some of these chain rule things, it doesn't work great. But it can, if you have something with like, oh, this has like a quotient, like three product rules and like two chain, like you can really make a dent in something like that with the technique we'll see in 3.6. Um, Jack? Um, so like you doing number 21, I think I messed up something. Sure. Where did it put it? That wasn't at all where I had had my cursor last. I think sometimes this thing just is trolling me. 21, you say? Yep. I screwed something there. It's just This one right here, Jack, is a super candidate for the shortcut I was talking about that we're going to see in section 3.6. This one would make, I could do this by doing three single link chain rules instead of doing a chain and a quotient. Or I'm sorry, two single link chain rules, sure. which are both going to be really easy chain rules to do. Um, but it is what it is. Um, so our f of x, hopefully we see is x cubed. Our g of x will then be the quotient. And I'll call those numerator and denominator h and k. So the derivative is going to be f prime of g of x times g prime of x and that quotient rule is going to be k of x times h prime of x minus h of x times k prime of x all over k of x squared so f prime of x is going to be 3x squared um, and then h prime of x is, what is that, 2x, k prime of x, also 2x. So I think we're good now, so I have 3, and then x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1 squared times um, x squared minus 1 times 2x minus x squared plus 1 times 2x all over x squared minus 1 squared. And again, I can simplify this numerator. That'll just come out to be negative 4x. Can you do that in your head? That's the advantage of being a math teacher. And just take my word for it. I don't want to write it all down. I'll just like 2x times x squared minus 2x times x squared, that's 0. And then 2x times negative 1 minus 2x times <laughs> positive 1, 
negative 4x. I just didn't want to write it all out. So there's that, and I don't know, could you write that any nicer? I'm not really, not substantially. I mean, you could move the 3 up in there and make it a negative 12. You could put the squared onto each of those and mush those two things together, but it's not like, you know, like, ooh, I could do, you know, I could do this, which is so much better. I don't know. Is it better? Is it's one frac, it is, I don't know. It's whatever. Uh, Teagues. Uh, can you do 13 and 3.3, please? 3.3? Sure. All right, um, so this is like a product rule inside of a quotient rule. And maybe we'll just call this stuff K of X. All right, so we'd have the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. The derivative of k of x, though, is going to be a product rule. So I'd have um, f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x So now it's just time to do some derivatives. So f prime of x is just 1. G, and I know my variables are all goofed up. I'm sorry. g prime of x is cosine of x. And h prime of x is just 1. So we have uh, 1 plus t times the quantity t times cosine x plus sine, uh, I should, cosine t, sine t times 1 minus um, t sine t times 1 all over 1 plus t squared. And if I simplify this down, can do a little here. Um, so if I foiled this out, I'd have t cosine t plus sine t plus t squared cosine t plus t sine t. And that'll cancel with that one. And so I have then t cosine t plus sine t plus t squared cosine t all over 1 plus t squared. I think that ought to do it. Oh, okay. Okay, that's what I got. I just didn't get the whole back of the book. Oh, what does the back of the book have? It's like t squared plus t. It's t squared plus t cosine t plus sine t. Oh, yeah. So all they did was they grouped these two guys together and factored the cosine off. Which, whatever. 
like to me it's the same yeah okay. right if you're if you're concerned like that what can you do to check you would type both of them into your calculator and see if you get the same graph right that's usually an effective way to check if two things are simplified the same as if you graph them and you get the same picture it's a nice self check Blake uh, could you use number 86? Which section? Uh, three, four. Four. You like those deep cuts. All right. Um, there it is. Sure. There's a lot of words here. All right. Uh, oh, this is, I know what I say. Okay. Air is being pumped into a spherical weather balloon. At any time t, the volume of the balloon, v of t, and its radius, r of t, at any time t, the volume of the balloon, oh, is V of t, and its radius is R of t. Okay. What do the derivatives dV dr and dV dt represent? Express dV dt in terms of dr dt. Okay. Uh, so dV dt or dV dr. That's a rate, right? Because it's a derivative. So it's the rate at which, what's the numerator's variable? Volume is changing with respect to the radius changing, right? So if you think about a balloon blowing up, you're talking about how much is the volume increasing as the radius increases or as it's deflating, how much is the volume cha changing as or shrinking as the, as the radius shrinks. Uh -huh. Just looking at the rate of those two things changing. And then for dvdt, that's just like um, the rate at which volume is changing with, with respect, respect to, to time. time changing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So I won't write that one down because we just said it aloud. Uh, so we have the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. That's a deep pull from geometry. So if I differentiate that with respect to time, huh? So if I'm doing ddt of v equals ddt of 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that becomes dv dt equals the 4 thirds pi is a constant, so I can just pull that out. And then the derivative of r squared is 3r squared. And then I get a dr dt because there's a chain rule going on here. Right, r is really a function of t. So it's like the outer function is this r cubed, and the inner function is r of t. You kind of get what I mean? Sure. So really what we have here is like v of t to the first is equal to 4 thirds pi r of t to the third. So this piece is a chain rule, right? Yeah. So I'd have three 
r of t r of t squared times r prime of t, which is the same thing as dr dt. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that just I just wrote it with the different notations because it asked for it using this uh, yeah, like with yeah. yeah, with these notations rather than primes. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I can Okay. So that's that's where that's so that's your answer. It just simplifies down to four I R squared <coughs> DR DT. Do you recognize that? Four R four pi R squared? It's the surface area for a sphere. <coughs> oh. I did not notice that. I'll tell you that. Again, that's, gee, I've been a math teacher for 15 years. You recognize those things. It's like, oh, yeah, it's the surface area formula. That makes sense that the first derivative volume is surface area. That's not surprising. Just like acceleration, velocity, position, all related. Surface area, volume, length, you know. Sure. All, yeah, sure. Don't forget about that. What you call me? Okay, today we're going to do section 3.5, which is all about something called an implicit differentiation. So we use, imp we, the question is like, how do I take a derivative if I don't know like which variable is the independent variable, which one's the dependent variable. So say like we have the equation x squared plus y squared is equal to 4. Here there's no implied independent and dependent variable because there's no like y by itself or no function notation to go along with it. Along with it declaring like this is the independent variable, this is the dependent variable. So what we'll do is if I want the derivative with respect to x, I'm going to take the do d dx to both sides. And I know that the derivative can just kind of distribute through there. And obviously the derivative constant is zero. What's the derivative with respect to x of x squared? 2x, okay. And what's the derivative with respect to y squared? No, it's a variable. Okay, not quite. So remember what we just did here, where when I differentiated with respect to t, because that variable didn't match the variable I had here, I got this dv dt, and again, the I differentiate with respect to time. When I differentiated the r, I got this dr dt. Whenever you take the derivative with respect to a variable that doesn't match your derivative, you get one of those differentials. So really here we should have 2x is fine because the x matches the kind of variable. But here... We're not okay. What else do we need here? A dy dx. And that's it. That's the gist of implicit differentiation. So if you differentiate a variable with respect to a different variable, you get one of these differentials. So our job now is to get the dy dx by itself. So I can subtract 2x from both sides and then divide by 2y and I get that 
dy dx is just negative x over y. Oh. Okay, Mr. Kulik. Well, that's that's all right. Let's try another. So you can treat dy dx as like a, a variable, right? It's, it's, like it's a quantity. Okay. So d dx is the operation of taking a derivative. Dy dx is a quantity. That's that's a that's the actual that's value that's of the it. derivative. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's an important okay. distinction notationally, right? The d dx is the operation. Yeah. dy dx is now the result of doing the operation. Oh. Right. Yep. Those are those are important distinctions notationally. Well, let's. I don't want to do this one yet. I had another one I wanted to do first. So let's say we have x cubed plus y cubed equals 6xy. Well, do the derivative of both sides. Okay. Uh, that derivative distributes. And then I can pull the 6 out front. Everybody happy with what I did there? Okay. Derivative of x cubed is, or derivative with respect to x of x cubed. We should be specific because we have a bunch of variables rolling around in here. What do I got? 3x squared. Uh, the derivative uh, with respect to x of y cubed is 3y squared dy dx, okay? And the derivative of xy is, nope, nope. Ah, it's a chain rule, or I'm sorry, a product rule, right? You have two variables multiplied together. Everybody okay with what I did there? So the derivative of y is 1 and then a dy dx. The derivative of x is 1. So now I just need to do a little bit of simplifying, get the dy dx onto one side. Um, so this side becomes 6x dy dx plus y. And I'm going to move that over to this side. And I'm going to subtract the x, 3x squared over to the other side. Oops, it's supposed to be 6y. Everybody's cool? So I put the terms of dy dx is on one side, the terms of dy dx on the other side. Factor off my dy dx. And then I can just divide both sides by 3y squared minus 6y. I'm sorry, 6x. And I suppose you could reduce this, right? There's a factor of 3 in everything. It's not an unreasonable reducing to do. Thank you.
Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh. Like. So, I'm just I'm a little bit confused. What exactly that like? So this two uh, y minus x squared over y squared minus two x. What does that like? What does that number really or that that like mean? That's going to be how I can calculate the derivative. Okay. At the or the slope of the tangent line at a specific point here, though, because I. My derivative is in terms of x and y. Okay. I'd need the entire point to plug in rather than just the x coordinate. Okay. Does that, that makes sense. feel yeah. good? Yeah. But it still does the same thing as the derivative. It's just still, it's still, it's still, it's still slope a of a tangent line. It's still a derivative. Yep. It just now it's defined in terms of two variables instead of one. Okay. Because in the original problem, there's no independent and dependent variable specified. Right to separate that to get the y by itself at the beginning, maybe is not even realistic to do. Right, the kind of clever factoring you need to pull to do that would be, yeah, it would be very sneaky. If it's possible at all, not every polynomial is factorable like that to where you could even do that. So, um, this is this type of an equation here where you have, like. That like this is called an elliptical curve, and not every elliptical curve you can separate the variables for to make like an independent dependent variable. So very often you can't, which is fine. Like we can still we can do this. Ooh. All right, uh, so if we do this one here, start the same way. We'll do the derivative of both sides. I'm going to stop showing quite as much work. Is that okay with everybody? I think we've kind of really hammered that a little, like notationally what's going on enough to where I can be a little bit more liberal with the step taking. So when I look at the derivative of sine x plus y, what do you see there? Chain rule, very good. So the outer function is sine x and the inner function is x plus y. So the derivative of sine is cosine, so that's the outer. And then derivative of x plus y is going to be Great, 1 plus 1 times dy dx. And do we really need the 1 times there? Not really, but it's fine. doesn't hurt anything. Uh, how do I differentiate y squared cosine x? Product property, very good. So I'll have y squared times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine x, and then plus cosine x times the derivative of y squared, which would be 2y dy dx. Everybody okay? All right. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and try to get the dy dx's onto the same side and all the non-dy dx's to the other side. So I'm going to distribute that cosine x plus y through. Okay, uh, I'm going to subtract that 2y cosine x dy dx over to the other side. And I'm going to factor the dy dx off. And then when I divide both sides by the cosine x plus y minus 2y cosine x, I 
get that. Any simplifying I can do here? I can mess with the negatives a little bit, but that's as good as I can do, right? If I divide a negative through, that makes everything in the numerator positive. And then it flips the signs in the denominator. But really, the previous one would have been fine, right? Still the same thing. Not significant simplifying that happened there, just messing with some negative signs. Whoop de doo doo! All right. Mr. Kulik, this doesn't seem really any different than what we've been doing. It's kind of the same thing, right? Notice there's new, new derivative rules being introduced here. Um, you're right. Uh, in a minute, we'll get a but, but let's look at this one. What are we looking for here? The second derivative. Yeah, okay. Um, for this one, I'm going to use the prime notations instead of the ddx notations, just for like a change of pace. Um, sometimes that'll be more convenient notationally to use than the ddx's. Um, but I just want to basically show you the, how to do it both ways, or what the notation looks like both ways. I would never require you to do one way versus another, Teagues. Um, in, the, in the solution, is the y squared sine x a negative? Uh, well, I, I, here, yes, in the simplified version where I divided by negative 1, oh, no. Oh, yeah. All right, so if I do the derivative of x to the fourth plus y to the fourth, what do I get? 4x cubed plus 4y cubed dy dx, except I'm going to write it as y prime. And the derivative of 16 is 0. I'm just going to use it to match the notation of the problem, right? But y prime is the same as dd dy dx, right? OK. So now I could separate and get y prime is equal to negative x cubed over y cubed. That required a little bit of simplification. And now I could either differentiate again at this step, which would involve quotient rule, or I could differentiate at this step, which would involve product rule. I'd probably, I'd prefer doing the product rule, I think, than the chain rule, all things considered. Everybody okay with that plan? It doesn't really matter. You can get to the same answer both ways. But if I'm looking at this, I'd probably say, okay. Maybe I'll stick with this one and just differentiate here. Okay. Uh, so the derivative of 4x cubed is? 12x squared. 12x squared. And the derivative of 4 xy, or I'm sorry, 4y to the third times y prime is? It's a product property. So I'm going to just pull the 4 out front. And obviously the derivative is 0, 0. OK, um, so the derivative of the first derivative is second derivative. Everybody's OK with that? The derivative of y cubed is 3 where y squared times y prime. Is okay there. Now, 
notice in this piece where I have a y prime times y prime, does that give me y double prime? No, that's y prime squared. Okay, just to be clear, that's an easy notational mistake to make. Um, so I'm gonna get the y double prime by itself. So I'm gonna subtract the other pieces to the other side. Oops, let's make that 12. Okay with that. And then I'm going to divide by the um, 4y cubed. So far, so good. Do we... Do you suppose that I want to write my first or my second derivative with the first derivative in it? No, man. What am I going to do? Make a substitution, because I already know what the first derivative is equal to. It's negative x cubed over y cubed. When I have an exponent of an exponent, we multiply. So negative x cubed squared becomes positive x cubed to the sixth. And y cubed squared becomes positive y cubed to the sixth. I'm sorry, y to the sixth. Notice here I can do a little bit of reducing. I'm going to get rid of the fraction inside of a fraction by multiplying the top and bottom by y to the fourth. What's going on? Everybody okay there? But there's one more very sneaky piece of simplifying that Mr. Kulik's going to do now. That's actually going to make this relatively significantly more simplified. Notice in the numerator, I have a greatest common factor of 12x squared. Sorry, uh, so I dropped my negative here. See this? Forgot that. Let's make it negative 12x squared. Okay, Mr. Gulick, so what? You're going to reduce the 4 and the 12 or something? Uh uh. Well, I'm going to do that, but uh uh. What's y squared plus x? Or y to the fourth plus x to the fourth? Six. 16. What? Why is that 16? That was the original problem, right? Oh, Mr. Kulik. That's 16. So do some reducing, and I end up with negative 48x squared over y to the seventh. Dude, that's not an uncommon 
thing that happens in a second derivative with an implicit differentiation is you end up being able to substitute back in the very beginning problem to do some massive piece of simplification. Not uncommon. It doesn't happen every time, but it happens a fair bit. Yeah, math. All right. Um, the last thing that we have in section 3.5 is we have a new set of derivative rules for the inverse trig functions. Don't get that excited. So we're going to be um, memorizing these by the test? Question mark? Yes. Nice. I was uh, good to hear that. Yeah. Do I want to make it? No, I said Oh, I'm sure somebody started one, haven't they? I've hinted that you should have done this for a while, a couple of times now, for these derivative rules that you just have to have memorized. If you make one and you send me the link to it, I'll put it on the class page so everybody can enjoy it. I'll credit you when you do it. Yeah. yeah. This this does not look right at all, does it? Uh, yeah. Isn't like sine to the negative first just close again? Okay. So sine x to oh the negative gosh. first oh, oh, is cosecant. Okay. I'll be on that. No, I, I get but y equals sine inverse of x is equivalent oh. to x equals sine of y. Gotcha, okay. Presuming that so y is between oops, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. No, that's OK. That's an important distinction like, Dan, to really, make. You're really over really overcomplicated such a simple idea. Yeah. I guess not. Um, so if I wanted to do then take the derivative of this, right? So if I take the derivative with respect to x to both sides, that becomes 1. And this would become cosine of y dy dx. And I divide both sides by cosine y. It's like, oh, OK, there's my derivative, right? The problem is our function was in terms of x. So our derivative should be in terms of x, not y. So let's go ahead and switch that out then. So note, if y is stuck in between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. What quadrants are that? Are those in on the unit circle? Four and one. Great. And in quadrants 4 and 1, what is the value of cosine? Positive. OK. So I know that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. So if I solve for cosine, that's plus or minus the square root of 1 minus sine squared. So is this, we're proving this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're just proving the first one. We're showing where it comes from. But this allows me to drop the plus or minus. Okay. Now, on the unit circle, sine is which co coordinate? Y. But we flipped everything, right? Remember that this was now x is equal to sine y? So what can I replace here? So 
So that can just become 1 minus x squared. So what do we have here? dy dx was equal to 1 over cosine y. And I know cosine y is equal to 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. That's my derivative rule for sine inverse. Woof, Mr. Kulik. Yeah, just memorize these. You don't want to have to derive this in an AP setting. Like, good luck with that. You don't have enough time. Yeah, of course. What's up? Oh. Yeah, no problem. I'll try to find some time today to update the memorized list. I think we're still in section 3.2 or 3.3. Three, three. I haven't updated it from there, but I'll, I'll get on it. Paul? Oh, you're good? Okay. All right. Well, that's it for uh, three five. I am going to start three six here. Well, maybe. Yeah, we'll start three six here. Um, with the intention that. Or I'd like to, anyways, do a homework quiz on Friday and then just deal with some questions from you guys and not continue on lecture wise on Friday. So I'd like to kind of keep going here today. Does that sound okay? Homework quiz would be just up through chain rule stuff. There's going to be no words, it'll just be like take the derivative of this thing. So all you need are the derivative rules. Should you have those memorized? Yeah. Teagues. So does that mean the test is going to have 3 uh, Well, we haven't finished 3 6. We won't finish it today. Um, and oh, so I. the test review isn't going to be Friday? No. Okay. No, no. We'll just deal with some questions and stuff. I just want to have. It feels like we just need a day to breathe. Yeah, this is true. So I'm trying to find a way to like do a little bit of stuff and just have like an exhale day before a weekend. Really appreciate that. So like, no. Oh, 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 3, 6, I hinted at that there's a nice shortcut coming. I don't know if we'll get quite to seeing that today, but um, we have, well, I suppose I can make that happen today. So we have these two derivative rules. So the derivative of log base b of x is going to be 1 over x times log, or natural log of b. And then, so obviously the natural log of x would be 1 over x times natural log of e, which is just 1, so just 1 over x. Um, so... So let's say we have y equals the natural log of x plus 1. What do you see here? It's a chain rule, right? So the outer function is the natural log, and the inner function is just x plus 3. So y prime is going to be the derivative of f of g of x times the derivative of g of x. And we know that the derivative of f of x is 1 over x. And the derivative of g of x is just going to be 1. So we have then 1 over x plus 3 
times 1, or just 1 over x plus 3. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, let's get down to this one. Just cut right to the chase. <laughs> If I have this, what do you see here? You see a quotient, a chain, and then a quotient, and then another chain. I see two easy chains. What are we going to say, Luke? Uh, I'm not going to do either, really. So, do you remember back from Algebra 2? <laughs> That's fair. We had these properties of logarithms. These guys are going to become your very best good friends. Once again, if they weren't already your very best good friends before. Remember, these were the power, quotient, and <clears throat> product properties for logarithms. When I look at this problem, I would begin by or expanding this logarithm, because then taking the derivative is much easier. Uh, so when we expand a logarithm, the order of the properties that we use, we do the quotient property, power property, or product property, and then power property for logs. So if I apply the quotient property first, I'd have that. There's no product properties going on, but there's a power property. Remember that the square root is the same thing as a one-half power. And now I'm going to take the derivative, because look at what I have to take the derivative of. Like super easy log problems. Derivative of the outside times derivative of the inside. Derivative of the outside times derivative of the inside. Done. You can make some common denominators if you want. I'll pass. <sighs> that was way easier than having to grind through like quotient properties and two chain rules going on inside of a quotient pro you know, like how much easier was that? That was nice, right? Now here's the hit, here's the best part. Are you telling me, Mr. Kulik, then if I had just like this, could I just do like the natural log of both sides? And then differentiate. Giving me my answer from before, since this is the same problem. And then I can just multiply the y back over. And I could be done. Like, is that, that seems easier than dealing with like the quotient and chain rule in there. Yeah, you can do this. This is okay. This has a name. This is called logarithmic differentiation. And the idea there is that you can replace product and quotient and power property or power rules for derivatives 
just by doing the log and breaking it all up with log rules then just replace everything with like single link chain rules which is often like way easier than having some like gnarly like oh there's a quotient inside of a product inside of a chain inside of another chain inside of a then another product on top of you know like just like oh my god mr kulik what did you cook up here it's like well maybe i just match your log both sides and break it up into pieces and pieces are all easy to differentiate teagues um can you explain oh did you did you just multiply the right side by one over y between the second and third steps yeah so i multiply both sides by y oh okay okay yep and this was from the previous example right right I skipped the work to do that. But that was that's pretty nice for a problem that would be like sizably confusing straight ahead derivative, right? It's not a trivial derivative to do. Wouldn't have been impossible or all that time consuming, but this is often, you know, the worse they get, the better this works. You know what I mean? In the in easy ones it's like that's not much help. Medium ones, it's like, yeah, it's kind of 50-50. But the tough ones, this is often much, makes life much easier. Um, all right, so the 3, 5 stuff. Did I write down 3, 5 problems already? Yeah, yeah. I did? Oh, thank goodness. Um, so we'll, we'll do a homework quiz Friday. It'll be just taking derivatives of things. So should know the derivative rules product quotient chain rule, and then like how to do the derivative of a power or a trig function or a um, exponential or the stuff we've looked at inside of those first three sections. No inverse trigs, no logs. Um, and then uh, we'll do some questions on that day and we'll just say that sounds good. We'll worry about the rest of three six on Tuesday then next week and then we'll look at a test sometime after that little uh, extended break that you guys have sound good Is it like 10? the no it's four. Oh. oh okay. yeah oh. they're not multiple choice they're not like conceptual like it's not on it's not on AP oh, Central okay. it's just like oh, okay. I wrote four problems for you and I'm gonna hand you a sheet of paper with four problems on it oh. okay. Paul. We get to do the thing we did last time where you can find the part more for like the harder way to scale. Uh probably not, because I didn't make a separate set of questions. The I think this one's is just like it's not conceptual. So it should be you just gotta kinda know it or you don't kinda